American History TV is at the William Trent House. It's the oldest house in the state at nearly 300 years old, and it's the city's namesake. The 1719 William Trent House Museum is located in downtown Trenton and is the oldest historic house in New Jersey. So William Trent was a Scottish-born merchant based out of Philadelphia. Um, his merchant business, despite his ups and downs, did make him very wealthy. And he purchased his first home in Philadelphia and his second summer home right here where we're standing. So his merchant business um, dealt with uh, shipping and both importing and exporting thing goods such as rum, molasses, wine, and he was also involved in the slave trade. Now, as well as some of the products that he did both import and export were slave made in both the West Indies and in Africa. So he did choose this location for its um, nearness to the Delaware River and the shipping routes, um, as well as being local to inland routes because once the objects were brought to the shipping area where they could no longer pass on the Delaware River, they went through inland routes via Mr. Trent. So he brought goods to Philadelphia and anywhere else that needed them. There were not a lot of air things in the area. Actually, when Mr. Trent came here, he became not only the major landowner, but also the major employer. So he had mills and breweries and farmlands and orchards and things like that. And he employed a lot of local people, so thus making him major landowner, major employer. And at one point, he incorporated the town, so he laid out the city streets and planning. So the locals started calling it Trent's Town. And from then, we get Trent's Town to Trenton. So he was actually the founder of the city. He started construction in this house in 1715. As I said, it was his summer home. He moved here with his second wife and their one child. Um, this house is built in the early American Georgian architectural style. Um, there are a lot of things that represent that here as we go through the house, I'll show you. But he started construction in 1715, completed in 1719. He lived here from 1719 to 1721 as his summer residence, and then from 1721 to 1724 as his all year round residents. We are currently standing in the grand entrance way. Um, this room would have been used as a multi-purpose room. Um, you would have been greeted by the butler who would have been liveried as a symbol of Mr. Trent's wealth. He would have had both his servants and slaves in colonial dress that would have been appropriate to their stature. Um, this area shows pretty much, uh, is, it's exhibited as a waiting area. Mr. Trent was a Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, so he did see business here. So we do have some chairs set up that would have been similar to what you would have seen during this time frame. So I'm gonna bring you into one of the first rooms that we have here um, to show visitors. This is the front parlor. This room would have been used for several purposes as well, um, to based on lighting and heating conditions. The way it's set up currently, it has nothing but antiques. This room is full of William and Mary furniture. If you take a look at some of the tops of these chairs, they have crowns on them. These are unfortunately not Mr. Trent's personal items, but these are antiques of the time period. So if they were imported to us any later, these crowns would have been hacked off, and we would have wanted no affiliation with the British crown. So they really are a fantastic find. If you look up and down the chairs, you see a lot of intricate scroll work. The William and Mary period was influenced a, a lot through Dutch, Flemish, and all sorts of different influences. So we see them here in the chairs. Mr. Trent was a wealthy merchant, and he did entertain a lot of important clients for both his business uh, throughout the courts, as well as just general entertaining and dining. He was well-to-do in the community, and he would have wanted to show that off. So any and everybody who would have been of his same status and class would have really spent some time here, and they would have engaged in dining like this. Downstairs here would have been a public place open to any type of public, and we would have wanted to show off at this time. So the doorways would have been larger, and there also would have been brass handles on the doors down here. And then the last thing is he has an item here called the King's Board. And if you take a look down on the floorboards, there is pretty much everything is of a same size, except for this board right here and the board underneath it. So this is something called the King's Board. This was a highly taxed item and pretty much used for the king's uses exclusively. Um, shipping, army projects, anything that he would have used. The fact that Mr. Trent blatantly has it on his front, on his front parlor floor is really pretty much saying that he doesn't care that it's taxed 
and it's the equivalent of having a very nice car in your driveway in today's standards. So Mr. Trent was showing off and this is the way he would have done it. So he was a wealthy merchant and what that meant for this time frame was that he brought in a lot of luxury goods for himself and his family members. He also would have had, as is on his probate inventory that was taken two years after his death, he did own 11 slaves at the time of his death, which actually accounted for about a third of his wealth. So we've come downstairs into the in-house kitchen at the William Trent House Museum. Now an in-house kitchen would not have been the most common thing during this time frame. This, the reason being was this was quite a fire hazard. But Mr. Trent was a wealthy man and he got what he wanted, so hence the in-house kitchen. So what you see here, um, this is our kitchen hearth. And there are a few different things in here that are really very interesting. We have something called a clockwork spit jack. And this is something that would have powered a rotisserie. Prior to this invention, this would have been something that would have been done by either slave labor or canine labor. They would have constantly had to turn the spit. The way this invention works is that there are two weights that will actually pull the spit down and it will continue to crank everything. And then once the weights have gone, come to the bottom, they would rewind everything and then the spit would just turn on its own. And also over here, you'll, if you take a look, we have something called a beehive oven. Now this would have been used for baking purposes and would have had a steel or iron door that would have kept it shut. But this was a very multi-purpose area. Is, if you compare it to a modern kitchen, this is your stove top and oven and everything all in one. So this is Mr. Trent's bedroom. This is in the upstairs portion of the house. What you see here is something called a camp or a campaign bed. This would have generally been used by the military and would have been used as a portable way to find some rest and or shelter. However, this version is quite overly large and is decorated with printed floral cotton sheets. And these would have been quite the luxury item at the time. Anything that would have been printed in cotton would have had to have been imported at a very high, highly taxable rate. This room is also separate from Mrs. Trent's bedroom. The convention at the time is that they would have slept separately, but both of which are adjacent to a hallway closet that they would have had access to both a servant for either both Mr. and Mrs. Trent or one for each of them. So he didn't spend a lot of time here, unfortunately. In fact, he is one of the residents who spent the least amount of time here, even though the, everything is named for him. Um, so from 1719 to about 1724 was his tenure here, and that did not include some of it being part-time. So he actually passed away on Christmas Day in 1724 in the house. So his death was unexpected. He died of what they are deeming an apoplectic fit, so either a stroke or a heart attack and was likely during this time for men who were not expecting to pass. He did not have a will, so again, they did a probate inventory two years after he died. We don't find any personal items or anything of that nature simply because family members would have come and taken things that they deemed important and things like that. So after Mr. Trent died, there were about 20 different residents of the house. Um, we've had some pretty highly prominent roles in history. Um, we have been a governor's mansion, a mayor's residence. We were on both sides of the Revolutionary War. We had both a loyalist and a patriot living here um, at different times, of course. And then we've also had several private residents, the last of which was Edward A. Stokes. And he actually gifted the house to the city in, um, at the end of his tenure in 1929. The house closed for a short amount of time, seeing as 1929 was not the best year for this country, but opened up again in the 1930s with help from the WPA and we have been open as a public museum since around the 30s or so. So when visitors come, I'd like to really impart to them how important this house is for the development um, and the continuous history that comes along with the area of Trenton. Um, this house has seen a lot of history, both when it was built by Mr. William Trent and all the other people who have lived here and since taken care of the property. Um, again, we have started from colonial times, revolutionary war times, to the present time, and this history is very important. Things that we can't forget, such as slavery and the pretty much how, how the expansion of colonialism, colonialism really brought about changes to this area.